This is the Great Hall of the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. It's a space that's alive with details and when it was first designed in the 19th century it was intended to inspire visitors to learn about the history of their country and to imitate and even exceed the achievements of the figures that they're seeing on the walls of the portrait gallery. The frieze is really the heart of the decoration on the interior of the portrait gallery. It was also the first element that was finished. It's a procession of key figures in Scottish history, strictly chronological, going back from the 19th century all the way to early man. And it's almost as if all the figures are looking back on the past. At the centre of the frieze is a figure of Caledonia, the representation of Scotland, and she's pulling back a curtain to reveal a starry sky. And that is a direct connection with our ceiling, which is a representation of the night sky in the Northern Hemisphere. The portrait in this very ornate frame on the eastern wall of the Great Hall here behind me is of John Ritchie Finlay. He was a philanthropist and his generous donation in 1882 kind of kick-started the project of creating a Scottish National Portrait Gallery. John Ritchie Finlay was the owner of the Scotsman newspaper and he had an incredibly strong sense of civic duty and the Latin phrase above his portrait by George Reid really alludes to that. It says, effort on behalf of civic good is never useless. Eventually, at the opening of the Portrait Gallery in 1889, it was revealed that John Ritchie Finlay had been this anonymous benefactor, and he stayed involved in the decision-making around the building and its decorations. Next to it, we have an announcement that we're now about to enter the National Museum of Antiquities in the eastern part of the building. This building is the first building in the world that was designed as a portrait gallery, but quite quickly it became apparent that the building would also have to house the Museum of the Scottish Society of Antiquaries. The coat of arms is one of many examples of heraldry throughout the decorative scheme of the building. The entrance, similarly, bears two coats of arms of Scotland, one from a 14th century manuscript, the other a 19th century version that is just above the door as you come in. And really that entire entrance tells us that this is a building about the history of Scotland and a very heroic history at that. It is flanked by perhaps the two most captivating figures in Scottish history, namely William Wallace and Robert the Bruce. In the end, 10 different artists were involved in creating the 31 figures around the outside of the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. In contrast, the interior decoration is a lot more unified because it is all the work of one artist. William Hole. When the portrait gallery opened, the walls were blank. The frieze wasn't here, the murals weren't here, and it wasn't until 1897 that William Hole was selected as the artist for this commission. Hole originally proposed 17 scenes to decorate the walls of the portrait gallery. But in the end, it was decided that the walls on the ground floor would not be decorated. So we are now left key with key scenes that take us from the mission of St. Columba to the marriage of James IV in the early 16th century. These murals look quite flat, almost like tapestries or book illustrations, and that effect is enhanced by the borders around each of the scenes. Again, the Scottish flowers and leaves connect to the carvings on the outside of the building. The frieze was the first element of the interior decoration that was finished, just over a year after Hole had been awarded the commission. 
The earliest figures represented in the frieze are representatives of the Stone Age and the Bronze Age, and these are references again to the Museum of Antiquities in the eastern part of the building. The frieze represents an interesting overview of changes in costume throughout Scottish history. It's also interesting to think about who's missing from this frieze, because even though it aims to give a very broad view of Scotland, many figures are omitted. It is a mostly male-dominated frieze, and we know that there are certain figures that were originally supposed to be in this frieze that were removed in later decisions. In the preparatory drawings for the frieze, where George Jameson appears now, there was originally a space for Oliver Cromwell, he would have been an isolated English character in a majority Scottish display, and he had also defeated Charles I, the descendant of James VI, the first king of both Scotland and England. So by replacing Oliver Cromwell with George Jameson, they did not only remove the reference to a defeat by a essentially Scottish king, but they also added in the first painter of note who was born in Scotland and who was a portrait painter. And other painters appear in the frieze, such as David Wilkie and Henry Rayburn. The frieze ends with Thomas Carlyle, who in his own lifetime was one of the most respected intellectuals of the 19th century. In 1854, he had sent a letter to David Lang of the Society of Antiquaries and explained why it was so important to have a portrait gallery dedicated to the great men of Scotland. His idea was that history was the sum of the achievements and the lives of great men. Our understanding of who has shaped the history of Scotland has certainly moved on from Thomas Carlyle's understanding of history being the history of great men. Although we are housed in a 19th century building, it's important to note that this is a building with an agenda. It's a building that looks back to the past to craft an inspirational narrative about Scotland for its visitors. But now we take a much more nuanced approach and we hope that we empower visitors to look closer and to debate rather than just accept one narrative.